online hate speech is a powerful thing. Sometimes all it takes is one tweet or post by a user and suddenly they're hit by tons of insults and threats. But is hate speech so dangerous that it should be censored? Or is freedom of expression more important? Hate speech versus free speech, our topic today on SHIFT. According to Facebook, only one in a thousand posts worldwide contains hate speech. The targets are often individuals, like homosexuals, Muslims or women who get hundreds of hate replies per day to something they've posted. But online hate speech can also target entire ethnic groups. And it can escalate tensions and incite real violence, says the UN Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide. Big massacres start uh, always with small action and language. No one would forget that the Holocaust was preceded by hate speech, hate crimes. And hate speech continues to escalate tensions and animosity between groups. Here are two recent examples. Myanmar an open smear campaign on social media against Rohingya Muslims. And a deadly crackdown by Myanmar's army sent over 700,000 Rohingya fleeing the country. Conflicts with the Muslim minority had flared up time and again over centuries. But since Myanmar's population gained access to the internet in 2014, targeted misinformation about the Rohingya was disseminated. South Sudan. Here, hate speech and social media has fanned the flames of civil war and further divided the country's 64 tribes. The platforms are used to spread propaganda targeting particular groups. In South Sudan, online attacks have also often been followed up by physical assaults. What about if hate speech is only online? Well, some say that this is so hurtful that it should be forbidden. Others call that censorship. They argue that we should be free to say exactly what we think. So where's the line between hate speech and free speech? The answer to that largely depends on the country you live in. Not even legal experts have managed to separate free speech and hate speech in a clear and binding way, says renowned American civil liberties activist Nadine Strassen. Hate speech refers to an emotion, which is inherently subjective. And uh, therefore, every single definition that has been devised ends up being inherently vague and subject to the discretion of whoever has power to enforce it. On top of that, definitions vary in different parts of the world. Denial of the Holocaust, for example, is illegal in 18 European countries. But even here, freedom of speech is upheld as a value worth protecting. Nadine Strassen is herself the daughter of a Holocaust survivor. Nonetheless, she says censorship isn't the right tool to use against hate speech. That well intended as the censorship is, it ends up doing more harm than good. And that is specifically true with respect to Holocaust denial or any other kind of disinformation or misinformation. In fact, any kind of censorship. Um, the natural human reaction is that more attention is drawn to the very message that one is seeking to suppress. The former chairwoman of the American Civil Liberties Union, or ACLU, is convinced that honest discussions are the only way to overcome distance between opposing sides. Counter speech is a very important factor, and by that I mean any use of your freedom of speech powers to persuade, educate, inform, rebut, uh, support, do anything you can to advance the positive messages of equality and inclusivity and uh, diversity and dignity and to rebut the counter messages. But there are limits. 
and these begin when individuals are directly attacked. If such an attack constitutes a criminal offense, such as libel or threat of bodily harm, it is no longer protected as freedom of speech. Tech companies have started taking more actions against negative content on their platforms, not least because laws in Europe have been tightened. But there is still plenty of hate speech on social media, because that kind of content brings money. Hate speech is controversial. It's highly emotive, and it attracts clicks. Critics maintain that companies like Facebook and YouTube are well aware of this and actively promote the spread of posts containing extreme content. Facebook's algorithm, for instance, long favored potentially controversial posts because they get more views and lead to people spending more time on the platform, which increases ad revenues. This was because they pursued growth in a way uh, that was reckless and uh, to promote content in a way that the sensational stuff would get more exposure. If you take extreme measures to get rid of all hate speech, then you're going to slow down uh, the growth. Facebook rejects these assertions. The company says it has 35,000 employees deleting hate speech posts. In the first quarter of 2020, Facebook took down over 9.5 million inflammatory posts, a new record. According to laws in Europe, companies are only obliged to take down hate speech after it has been reported. But in closed groups, content is only visible to members. So it's unlikely hate speech there will get reported because posts are being seen by like-minded audiences. This is true for chat groups and also for online gaming communities, where hostility can be expressed in a different way. Steam, the world's largest PC games platform, is not without violence. Players here can meet in shooter games they've developed themselves to massacre homosexuals or Jews, amongst others. Far-right chat groups have links to closed hate speech groups on Telegram. These have clear rules that everyone must follow, as Kevin well knows. He committed violence offline to become a member. I wanted to get ahead. I wanted to prove myself, to say, I'm here, notice me. That's why I beat someone up. I told the leader and even sent him a picture. I took that photo to prove I belong to the group, that this is my family and I'd do anything for them. These days, Kevin no longer hangs out in right-wing chat groups. In Germany, the majority of hate messages online, about three quarters, comes from right-wingers. About 9% are by left-wing extremists, and 14% cannot be definitely assigned to any political orientation, according to Germany's federal criminal police. What I find especially interesting is that about half of all likes for hate comments come from a really small number of users, only about 5%. Experts have long known that hate speech campaigns are often well prepared and carefully timed. Only someone who's been targeted by such a campaign can know how devastating it can be. Someone like Steffi Brachtel from Freital in Eastern Germany. In 2015, she launched an initiative to help refugees in her hometown. In 2015, as sentiment in Freital was turning against refugees, Steffi Brachtel founded an organization to promote openness and tolerance. She was soon bombarded with online hate messages. You should be raped too, and get out of town. We have the baseball bats ready to go. Things like that. That was just the beginning. Her mailbox was also blown up, and people followed her at night. It felt like it was coming closer and closer. I'd come home and would immediately lock the door behind me. Then I would first check every room holding pepper spray in my hand. It almost bordered on paranoia. But I think at moments like that, being afraid can be good to a certain extent, because it makes you cautious and alert. The hostility she experienced online has left its marks. There are days when the verbal attacks just roll off me. I can stand there and say, oh, come on, you can kiss my butt. And there are days when it really hurts, when all at once I fall silent and take a step backwards. That's horrible. And a lot of people have had similar experiences. 
There are organizations that specialize in dealing with hate speech and digital assaults to help those who have become targets of hate campaigns. One is Hate Aid in Berlin. The first thing hate aid employees try to do is to stabilize hate speech victims emotionally. Next, they scan the hostile content for posts that could carry legal consequences. But not all those attacked wish to file charges. This also has financial reasons. If you've been libeled or threatened for a post, and you go to a lawyer who says, all right, we'll take it to court, you're facing at least 2,000 euros in costs. And if you lose, you have to pay the other side's legal fees. That's another 2,000 euros. Hate aid advises people free of charge. If someone can't pay the court fees, the organization offers legal aid. It also provides practical online security coaching. A huge problem online right now are attempts to get people's private data, like their home addresses or children's schools. We help them comb the internet before the haters do and hide that sensitive data. A good 500 people have contacted the organization over the past two years. 65% were female. When women or girls are attacked online, threats often have sexual connotations. Many attackers remain unknown, shielded by the anonymity of the internet. Annalena van Hodenberg recognizes that it's important for people to be able to be anonymous online. But if someone violates the law, she thinks their identity shouldn't be protected. A huge problem we have in Germany and in almost all European countries is that acts are committed online, which courts rule are punishable, but websites won't hand over the culprit's data. So basically, they're protecting the guilty ones. There, we have to say clearly, this has to change. If a German court rules that an offense has been committed, then websites have to be compelled to cooperate. I'm grateful to say I've never been targeted by hate speech. Have you? How do you defend yourself against abuse and hate speech on the internet? Let us know on Facebook or YouTube. Bye and see you soon.